was harsh on peace, but he was a new pope. I'm not sure you, you were looking at your televisions before you came out and probably anxious to get back to see the 9 o'clock news maybe as well, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there as, as, as fast as we can. Uh, the theme we have for tonight is, are we handing on the faith or can we hand it on? Um, <coughs> it's a topic I think that comes up all over the place and um, I've been involved over the years with various dioceses looking at planning for the future and reflecting on where we are and where we want to go and need to go and the rest of it. And of course, one of the questions that comes up all the time is, you know, how do we hand on the faith to the next generation? Or the next generation is losing the faith, or they haven't got it. So that's kind of the context or the backdrop against which we might uh, carry on our reflection this evening. And an image I have for it is that of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. You know that story, that Easter story, when the two disciples leave Jerusalem and they're going out the road to this place called Emmaus. And they're talking about what had happened <coughs> a few days before. That this man, Jesus, in whom they had placed all their trust and confidence had been crucified. It's as if their hopes and their expectations had been dashed. And they must have been asking themselves, where do we go from here? How do we regroup? Or was it all an illusion? Or what's the future for us? What does the future hold? And then, of course, they're joined by this stranger who asks them, what are they talking about? And helps them to make sense of all that had happened. He begins to explain the scriptures to them, helps them to make sense of their own faith journey. And then they have a meeting together and he disappears from their sight. And at the end of it, they go back to Jerusalem again to tell the others what had happened. Now I think that's maybe a good kind of image for most people who are here with it, maybe with one or two exceptions, in the sense that we have all come from another place. We have come from maybe a place of, at least what we thought was, a certain security about our faith and the way we live it and maybe being able to take it for granted almost. And it was supported by the community and those around us. And pretty well everybody practiced and participated and we didn't have to question too much. But now we find ourselves in a very different, a very different situation. Maybe those dreams or those uh, that ideal world that we had has somehow collapsed, somehow collapsed anyway, and we're in a different space and we're not too sure where we're going. So that, that image of the disciples kind of corresponds with that. that their world was shattered. They were on a, a journey not too sure where they were going or how to make sense of things. They were joined by Jesus who helped them to to, to make so, uh, some sense of it. I take a quotation here that sort of summarizes the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Like them, we continue to speak with one another about all that God has been doing in our midst. Like them, we're on the road, in Via, amidst a journey. And like them, many of our experiences have been unsettled. As our tightly held expectations are disturbed, the gift of the Lord's presence the power of the Spirit is ours to receive, and the Lord is in our midst, no less than on the road to Emmaus, a companion on the journey as a teacher, and this question of handing on the faith. And I just took uh, a sample statement of this from the Diocese of Killaloo, where I happen to be living at the moment, and I've been involved with them a little bit in reflecting on where they want to go into the future. And they have had a listening process in the Diocese over the last uh, year or two, and this is kind of a summary from, one element of a summary of what has come up from that listening experience. And they said, the feedback reflected a desire that the faith inherited from previous generations be passed on as well as a deep anxiety about how to connect with young people about faith issues. The 
The group recognized that the dominant focus on faith and young people may distract adults uh, connect, reflecting on their own faith and how it is expressed today. So you can see there a concern of the whole diocese about the faith that was inherited being passed on. How do we do it? How do we communicate that uh, with the younger, the younger generation or, or the next generation? So if we look at maybe where we're starting from, or that world, if you like, that has, has been uh, unsettled. At the moment, we have an average attendance rate, and it's only one element of how we might measure the faith of the country, maybe not even the best measure, but an average attendance rate of about 35%. When I was ordained a priest in 1979, or was even around 1980, the figure was still well over 90%. So like in our experience here, there has been an enormous decline say, in the last 30 years, and particularly in the last 10 or 15 years, I think the very steep decline has come. It's probably a little bit higher in rural areas than it may be in the urban areas. The other is a huge drop in vocations to priesthood and religious life. Again, I want to think of that in the vignette of that here. I was already in 79, I come from the Diocese of Aconry, um, which is one of the smallest dioceses in the country. It's about the size of a, a big uh, urban parish, maybe. Some years ago, when Bishop Kirby was out uh, visiting the Pope, you know, when they go on this visit every five years, um, the Pope had the map on the desk beside him, and he said, now, where's your diocese? Uh, Bishop Kirby, and he said, well, it's here. And the Pope said, this is John Paul. And he said to him, and what's the population of the diocese? And he said, about 35,000 to He said, a bit small, a bit big for a parish, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so I belong to a diocese like that. It's maybe a bit big for a parish. But in 1979, we had four priests ordained for that very small diocese or that big parish, if you like. I think there were something about five or six ordained for the whole country last year. You know, so just put those two figures side by side. Uh, we haven't had anybody ordained in that diocese for the last 10 years. And uh, I don't know who would have joined religious life in the meantime either. You know, so that, that whole landscape has changed. Um, lessons. Um, what opportunities um, do we create within a parish or in an area for them to meet within that kind of faith environment, broadly speaking. What kind of liturgies have we that involve them? Actual involvement, music, reading, prayer of the faith, so all of that. One of the Irish Jesuits some good number of years ago did a, a fair bit of work on this. And he was saying that if young people are actually engaged and involved in an activity, they're not nearly as self-conscious maybe as we think they are. If there's that half dozen or a dozen of them doing something together, as far as they're concerned, the whole world is doing it. You know, that, that, that peer support, they're very conscious of the peer group to which they belong. So all the activities do we have for them? Social concern projects, maybe pilgrimages, retreat days, um, fun-filled activities, you know, that are somehow uh, well structured for them. Um, again, you know, an active diocesan youth service, all of those things are hugely supportive. Finally, then maybe this adult faith formation. In that, again, good liturgy is well, well celebrated. Our responsibility is to say that it's two way clergy and people. Are. How active and how wholehearted is our response and our engagement uh, from the pews as well as from the other side? Um, I think good communications within the parish create an awareness of all the very positive creative events that are already happening. And that a lot is happening in parishes all over the country. And very often we're not even aware of them or conscious of how many people are actually involved. Michael Drum, who's involved in the um, Catholic school service, often draws attention to the fact that something like 17,000 people in this country are involved in boards of management in Catholic schools. That's a huge number. 
you know, who give voluntarily of their time and quality time and expertise. So there, that's not just one area, and we hardly think of it even as a parish activity, we think of it as a school activity. But actually, it's a responsibility of the parish. It's not just the school, it's the, it's the parish that's doing it. Um, is there an opportunity that the clustering of parishes maybe to be more imaginative in, in this regard? It's more generously and more freely than before. So the very act of coming together is hugely important to be nourished by the Word of God, to be nourished by the Eucharist, to be energized, to communicate and share that faith. Maybe to uh, finish with those words of St. Francis again when he sent out the first flyers and the first Franciscans on their preaching missions. He said, in your preaching, you may use words if you have to. In other words, the witness of your lives will be the most effective way you have in finding out the faith. What motivated people in the past? What, what sustained that kind of world that we have lost? or that we think we have lost anyway, or that certainly has changed. I suppose there was a strong sense of obligation. Um, we felt uh, the sense of the Sunday obligation, or the rules of the church, the commandments and all the rest of it. People had a greater sense of complying with um, rules and guidelines. I suppose in all areas, not <coughs> just with regard to religious matters, you know, the Joe Duffy program wasn't available, you know, to question everything. We couldn't talk to Joe so readily, so we had to get on with it. Um, there was maybe the fear of, of mortal sin. That was probably strong in a lot of people's minds. If you'd miss Mass on Sunday, it was regarded as a, a mortal sin. Um, Maybe more realistically, there were things like strong family and social pressures. When you belong to a fairly uh, tight-knit community, you are kind of odd if you didn't go to Mass on Sunday, whatever your level of belief. So it was easier to trot along than maybe to stay at home, or go for a game of golf, or whatever you might have done otherwise. Um, I think our culture generally was more open to the transcendent, more open to mystery, to enchantment, more open to the presence and the reality of God. We had a greater sense, maybe, of God's presence in our lives, God's action in our lives. So what's happening that um, all of that has, has broken down? I think there has been, a thing that has influenced us hugely and has affected us is the breakdown uh, of community based on residence. You know, I don't know a lot about the store here, but I don't know even at home about the dream where I come from. You have a whole lot of housing estates now around the town, and you wouldn't know, I wouldn't know anybody in them hardly. There's no sense of being <coughs> connected with people, even those beside whom you might be living, you know, particularly in newer estates. Where I live in Ennis at the moment, it's a well, um, I settled the state. I literally only know one. I'm living there over a year, and I literally only know one family by name around me. So we talk about community, and priests often talk about community, the parish community. But the reality is, if you're out there in an estate, unless let's say you have children going to a school, or you have reasons to be interacting that way, you may not have any great sense of community any great sense of belonging. So that kind of draw that might have been there in the past, I don't think uh, is so strong anymore.